Hostage, a Todd Mills mystery, book three in the series. Arthur R.D. Zimmerman, publisher, Scribble Pub. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter four. With all that had happened in the last year, Todd had wondered every now and then if he had lost it, his thirst for broadcast journalism. It used to be that he'd be up and going any time of day to scoop a story, particularly as the lead investigative reporter on WTCN's Crime Eye Report, hoping to catch a crime of any kind on videotape. He and a photographer had chased around the city, following lead after lead, more often than not finding nothing but sometimes hitting a bullseye. He recalled the rush of capturing that guy as he broke into the jewelry store. His jaded girlfriend had called to tip off Todd and the charge of filming the suspects in a cop killing as they got together to brag about their murderous caper. Ah, yes, and there'd been almost a dozen cats and trees, a few of which had proved to be interesting adventures. Then after Michael's death, there'd been the long, empty spell where nothing seemed to make a difference. No, what he'd lost professionally, Todd realized as he steered his dark green Jeep Grand Cherokee to the studios of WLAK-TV, wasn't his thirst for broadcast journalism, but something else, his arrogance, or at least more than he could afford. To be in this business, you had to be controlled, you had to be supremely confident, even if you sensed you were doomed for failure, you had to boast that you were going to get a shot of a judge buying cocaine when everyone thought it was sheer stupidity. Then sit there in a van for three, four, five days until you got that very judge on tape doing just that. Buying drugs. Ever since Michael's death, however, Todd was more emotional than he could afford to be. He gave away too much. He got angry too easily. Exactly, he thought. If you're going to keep your job at Channel 10, if you, you're ever going to win another Emmy, you're going to have to revert to your old egotistical arrogant self. But was that possible? Okay, so he was nervous today. That was understandable, but he couldn't show it, not by any means. He was nervous, but as he drove along Highway 394, he realized, too, that he did feel confident, even strong. He wouldn't have been able to do this story a year ago, at least not in the way it should be done. To do a great interview, you need to be honest and blunt. And yes, arrogant. And any earlier than this, Todd would have been too afraid to ask Johnny Clariton certain questions for fear of what they might elicit. But now, now, Todd was no longer afraid of having the spotlight turned on himself, which meant that it no longer mattered to Todd whether viewers liked him or not, depending on his sexuality or even the ties he wore. Deep inside, he was no longer terrified of what people would think if they knew the real Todd Mills. No. First things first, and what mattered most to Todd now was the quality of his work. Odd, he thought, as he pulled off the Louisiana Avenue exit and neared the station. But he'd lost sight of that over the years. Instead, he'd sought success, accolades, awards, any and all external praise to bolster his own sense of self-worth. Well, screw all that. He was back, and back for all the right reasons. Thank God for WLAK, the upstart station that had lured Todd back into the business with a generous offer. At first, Todd had bulked, but then they'd given him everything he'd wanted and then some, pleading for him to accept their offer. Channel 10 management had said, We just want Todd Mills because who else around here has won a couple of Emmys? That's polite bullshit, doll, counted his agent Stella from her California office when he'd first told her about the offer. They want you because your name was smeared everywhere up there and all over the country. You've probably got more name recognition out there and many whatchamacallit than anyone else. Between you getting the Emmys and poor Michael getting himself killed, just be aware of that. And if you decide you want the job, let me know. I'll make them pay through the nose, but don't forget, I'm sure I can. Thanks, Stella, but I don't want to relocate right now. Yeah, 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 doll, but you did make a lot of the national papers, so for another six months or so, I can get big bucks for a guy like you. After that, and no offense meant, the free ride is over, expired, kaput. You know, I still got some feelers out at CBS, like maybe they could use you to cover some of the gay issues. It could be great, you know, 
Oh, and Todd, there's something I've been meaning to ask you. What do people eat out there? Okay, okay, he thought, pulling into the lot in front of the low, white building. Don't deceive yourself. WLAK hired you because of the sensationalism around your career. And they gave you the Clarendon interview because you're gay. And given the good congressman's remarks, their betting sparks will fly. It was like sending a black reporter to interview someone from the KKK. Sizzle. In these conniving times, he also assumed Clarendon's handlers were equally savvy that they knew Todd was queer and perhaps had even sought him out for that very reason. Clarendon's complicity in agreeing to an interview with a gay reporter, therefore, could only mean one thing. He hoped to turn it into a political gain of some sort. Todd's challenge, on the other hand, was to trounce on Clarendon and expose his true motivations and thoughts. Christ, realized Todd. This wouldn't be an interview so much as a duel, and he had to come into it as confident as an enraged bull. He parked behind an entire row of dark blue Ford Explorers, emblazoned with the Channel 10 logo, then walked past a half dozen satellite dishes, 20 and 30 foot things aimed toward the sky. As he approached the employee entrance, he pulled a pass card from the outer pocket of his briefcase, then swiped it in the door and buzzed himself in. The corridor he walked down was broad and softly lit with awards and celebrity photos lining the walls. A guy darted from a side hall and dashed toward the door. If it isn't Bradley WLAK's top photographer, said Todd of the man who would be shooting his interview with Clarendon. Please, joked the black man, who had short hair and one gold earring. I'm a photojournalist. You're not going anywhere, are you? No. Don't worry, I'm just going to get something out of my car. Great. Todd glanced at his watch. Listen, I think we ought to leave about noon and give ourselves plenty of time. Sure. I'll meet you in your office. Todd turned into the newsroom. A huge space with exterior windows on one side, 20 cubicles grouped in the middle, the raised assignment desk looming over all, and various private offices and technical rooms on the other sides, always fluttering with the hyperactivity of reporters, editors, and producers. The 35 people who toiled away in this one room were responsible for broadcasting almost six hours of news a day, beginning at 5.30 in the morning to back up the anchors with news footage. It took roughly 20 minutes of tape for each minute on air, and it amazed Todd how the creative anarchy back here emerged so cleanly and professionally on screen. They pulled it off in part because Channel 10 had been completely and thoroughly computerized, from the keyboards and monitors on each and every desk to the robotic cameras and studio, A, that danced like angels with the touch of a computer screen. Grabbing himself a cup of coffee from an industrial-sized metal coffee pot that sat back in this corner, Todd ignored the newspapers from around the country that were stacked to one side. If there was any Clarendon news this morning, which was the main reason Todd had come in, it would be found on the wire service. Unlike the staff at Channel 7, the bunch here was a friendly group and various hands waved and faces smiled as Todd walked through the center of the newsroom toward his office on the far side. Hi, Mary, he called to one of the reporters who sat in her cubicle to the right. Knock em dead today, will you? Just for you. It's still a go, called the assignment editor. Frank, a burly guy with thin brown hair who was coordinating today's activities like a mad ballet. One o'clock, and he's yours. Great. There'd been some worry, uh, after all, that Clarendon might cancel again on Channel 10 six months ago, and on another brief trip before he had a book to sell, the congressman had backed out literally seven minutes before a scheduled interview. Using that as leverage, Todd had managed to get Clarendon's PR person to grant him an exclusive interview. Todd entered his office a small glass-walled space on the far side of the newsroom, and before he even put down his briefcase or took off his overcoat, he had a couple of keys on his computer keyboard. As he hung up his code, his messages came up on the color screen, and he sat down and quickly scrolled through them. Nope, nothing that couldn't wait until later this afternoon. Next, picking up his phone and checking his voicemail, he found five messages, including one from Janice, his girlfriend. 
the lesbian, as he called her, with whom his life was so intricately entwined. She was visiting family in Santa Fe, and she had called to wish Todd good luck with the interview. But I wish you were here, Todd, she said on the message. All of us do. It would have been really terrific. There was a knock on the glass, and Charisse, one of the producers, a woman with rich black skin, poked her head in. Todd, I just wanted to let you know, they were entering your pieces on the Mega Mall and all the awards. That's great. Yeah, they're both among our most widely watched segments of the year. Does that mean I get to keep my job? It's been a rough decision, but I guess so, she said with a smile. While Todd despised the Mega Mall because it threatened to turn Minneapolis into a donut city, another sprawling Detroit with its shopping and life drained from the city core. Todd knew that viewers first and foremost loved a someone done somebody's wrong story. With that in mind, he had first focused on the crime at the Mega Mall. That wasn't being reported because it was happening within the confines of a private establishment. With a tip from a former gang kid, they had vide videotaped one mugging, two car thefts, and a handful of hookers scoring in one of the bars. Next, a guide from some part of the dismembered Yugoslavia had taken him on a tour, starting at the Grand Balcony, a perch attached to the food court that overlooked the enormous indoor amusement park, and then continuing all the way down into the space where they were, planning to build the Humongo exhibit and ride called Journey to the Center of the Earth. But where they were about to start construction on buried dinosaurs and rivers of lava, Todd had failed to find any safety flaws. There was a rumor that payoffs had been made to building inspectors, and when Todd could find no evidence of that either, he focused the second segment on how little taxes the mall actually generated, since there was no sales tax on clothing in Minnesota. You know, added Charisse, the Clarendon interview will probably be even more widely watched. We've had promos running for the last two days. Well, don't worry, I'm going to give you guys fireworks. I'm sure you will. Good luck. Todd turned back to his computer, calling up LexisNexis, a professional research database. Yesterday, he'd printed out no less than a dozen articles from sources such as the Washington Post and the New York Times, and he'd taken them home and read them all last night highlighting key points in any and all crackpot pot comments the congressman had made in an interview such as this. Todd liked to find the subject's main buttons and then, of course, hit the biggest one first. Naturally, Todd was going to go right to health care and Clarendon's comments on AIDS. Then he'd move to the book, which was drawing fire because of the millions of dollars he was earning from it. Hey, and wasn't the thing ghost-written? And lastly... The national budget, more specifically Clarendon's tax plan, which sounded good but didn't seem to add up. Todd had stayed up late, scratching notes and questions on a yellow legal pad, and now he scrolled through the research program, hunting the wire services for last-minute news. There was news about a storm brewing in the Rockies, something about an overturned school bus in New Hampshire, more on the political problems of Russia, but only a couple of small mentions of Clarendon's book tour. Searching for anything else, new or old, Todd scrolled on and on through listing after listing, although he couldn't convince himself he really didn't need anything more. But he pushed on at the same time, trying to visualize how the interview might go, what might happen without ever thinking about it. Todd did a great share of his work in the shower on the road while he jogged, and now while he busied himself with an essentially unnecessary task. An odd title popped up on Todd's screen, one he had noted yesterday, and he hit the retrieve button. Seconds later, a short, humorous article appeared from the L.A. Times in which a reporter wrote how Clarendon was the master of saying something totally weird right at the beginning of an interview. Todd pondered this a minute, then realized something quite important. So, Clarendon was that kind of ass, was he? Completely consumed, Todd was startled. When his office phone rang, checking his watch as he picked up the receiver, he realized that nearly 45 minutes had passed. Channel 10, this is Todd Mills speaking. Hey, it's me. Todd immediately smiled. Rollins. Clutching the handset in his right hand, the interview and everything else vanished. Todd said, so what did the doctor say? We're on for New York, right? What? 
the doctor. What did he say about your sinuses? Will you be able to fly next week? I don't know yet. I mean, my appointment's not until after lunch. I'm still at your place. Oh, just lying around, are you? Joke Todd. So what's up? You won't believe it. We got a witness. A witness? A witness for what? I called down to the station to check on messages, continued Rollins, referring to the police station. And some old guy across the street from Kurt's apartment saw something. Todd had been so focused on the interview that at first he couldn't quite switch gears. Someone saw what? You're talking about the night Kurt died, asked Todd. Exactly. Granted, it's not much, but it's a start, replied Rollins. You see, there's this old guy who lives across the street from Kurt's apartment building, and he hasn't said anything before this because he really hasn't gone out this winter. Something about a bad hip. I don't know how or why he wasn't questioned, but but anyway, the night Kurt died, he hears something right outside his back door. He puts on his glasses, goes into the kitchen, and turns on the light, and what do you think he sees? Some kids? No, a bunch of raccoons in his garbage, so he bangs on the door and scares them away, and they dart out from dragging some junk with them. The old guy then goes to the front of his house without turning on any lights, and when he looks out the window, he sees the raccoons in the middle of the street, ripping apart a McDonald's bag. Apparently, his grandson had stopped by and brought him some dinner. Gutsy little things. He thinks gutsy because they broke into the garbage and stole the last of his dinner, and gutsy because they're not even frightened by some guy walking down the street. Get this, a guy who turns and heads into Kurt's building. You're kidding! Nope. So what does this guy look like? Pressed Todd. Did the old man see much? Better yet, does he even remember? He was wearing a dark coat and hat, and he was white. Great. I wonder how many white guys in Minneapolis own dark coats. True. It's not much to go on, replied Rollins over the phone. But it does prove someone went into the building, and whoever that was obviously went into Kurt's apartment because none of the other tenants had any visitors that night. None. That much we already know. Any idea what time of night this was? Shortly after two, the old man is sure about that because he looked at his bedside clock when he got out of bed. Which is about when Kurt died, said Todd, recalling the coroner's report. So it obviously wasn't a simple suicide. Nope. Either it was an assisted suicide, which I suppose isn't all that bad, is it? Or... Or just a plain old murder. It probably wasn't the later, pointed out Todd. After all, nothing had been taken, not Kurt's stereo or his VCR, or even his gold watch, which was sitting right on his dresser. So, given Kurt's health, commented Todd, I suppose an assisted suicide is the logical explanation. I mean, if I were that sick, I'd probably want something like that. With a deep sigh, Rollins added, Yeah, me too. But listen, I have to get going. We're leaving in about 20 minutes. Well, good luck. And Todd? What? Don't forget your tie. Thanks. I'll put it on right now. I'll be thinking of you. And I'll be thinking of you, Todd hesitated. Listen, if your doctor says you can't fly, we can cancel everything in New York and just take a drive up to Lake Superior or something. Don't worry, I'll be fine. Even though I had to do it before he said too much about our plans, I thought I would have been more upset about killing Kurt. On the other hand, did I really kill him? Or did I merely help him catch an earlier train out of his own personal hell? I mean, let's face it, anyone would have done as much for a dog in half the pain. I've never seen anything more cruel than AIDS. The way it attacks your entire body and creates all those sores and weird infections... They used to say the lucky ones got something like pneumonia and croaked overnight. Now they say the lucky ones get the pills, all those protease inhibitors or whatever. Frankly, I don't know which is better. No one does, actually. Over these long years of the epidemic, I've just seen too many guys linger and linger, bouncing from crisis to crisis, hope to despair, Kaposi's sarcoma to blindness to fungal infections, Nowadays, some guys are able to get their T-cell back up there, but who knows for how long. Sure, the new drugs are inching toward promise, but if you ask me, AIDS is like watching the end of your own life come racing towards you. You know it's going to smash right into you eventually. 
take you six feet under and there's nothing you can do. Watching Kurt fade away over the past year has affected me like nothing else. So would I do it again? You bet. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.